In the last couple of years, celebrities like Elon Musk, Seth Rogen, and Miley Cyrus have openly advocated a substance-friendly lifestyle that has triggered a psychedelic renaissance. Not only are popular substances now legal and regulated, but the common consumers are also embracing the ancient shamanic history of the substance consumption as well. This reawareness towards medicinal substance consumption has also brought many uncommon organic products into light with increasing awareness. Not a lot of people know that common kitchen supply items such as nutmeg, cinnamon, betel nut, and wormwood can be hallucinogenic in their unprocessed form. And the strangeness of these substances doesn't stop there. Welcome to Nutty History. Today we're exploring all the forbidden psychedelics that were used throughout history for holistic and ritualistic purposes. The Mystery of Soma you never heard the term soma? Uh -uh. It's like an ancient term for like some sort of a magical elixir. Am I saying that right? In the utopian science fiction book, A Brave New World, Arthur Aldous Huxley imagined a world without sadness, anxiety, and dissatisfaction. According to the narrator, whenever somebody in this happy society would be troubled with disturbing or depressing thoughts, they would administer soma in their body or go on soma holidays. Huxley's medicinal marvel compound was inspired by a mysterious psychedelic mentioned in Indian mythology with the same name, Soma. Like the ambrosia of Greek mythology, Soma was a forbidden beverage that could only be consumed by gods and selective royalty that would give the drinker a taste of immortality. Mentioned in the scriptures called the Rig Veda, the Soma was brewed by the Vedic king of deities, Ender, who would gulp it before battles as it would imbue him with strength, alertness, clear vision, and even immortality. Coincidentally, the Zoroastrian religion of ancient Persia also mentions a divine plant called Homa that was mixed with milk and consumed by Zoroaster's parents before conceiving him. The mythical source of Homa is a shining white tree that grows on a paradisiacal mountain. Sprigs of this white Homa were brought to earth by the divine birds, which possibly could be a poetic way to describe seed dispersal by migrating birds. Maybe. Today it is believed that the real plant that was harvested to create Soma or Homa is a Phaedra Seneca, a Chinese plant with yellow stalks, and it is indeed psychedelic. There is also speculation that datura was one of the main ingredients of soma in a similar way it is used to make bong, an Indian psychedelic closely related to another Indian god, Shiva, who wears moon in his hair bun. Bong, which could be considered as the immortal version of soma, has been consumed for centuries by Hindus in the form of beverage, edibles, and smoke for rituals performed by auguries, nagas, and devotees of Shiva. A lot of Hindus also partake in bong consumption during the Hindu holidays of Holi and Shiva's birthday. The closest way to consume bong, like Soma, is considered to be mixing it in a cool beverage, Tandai, which literally means chill beverage. And the drink is made with lots of dry fruits, honey, milk, and common Indian spices such as turmeric, cardamom, cinnamon, and cloves. Unfortunately, none of these Vedas or Zoroastrian Avesta mention the features of the source. However, in 1967, Gordon Wasson, in his book Soma, Divine Mushroom of the Immortality, proposed that the mushroom Amanita muscaria was a source of the fabled psychoactive drinks. In one of our previous videos, we talked about how this mushroom had also been considered the source of hallucinogenic substances consumed by the Viking warriors, berserkers. Even though Wasson's theory sparked interest among archaeologists and anthropologists regarding the recipe for the Soma brew, this research ends up proving Wasson's assumptions completely wrong, though, as modern scholars have a consensus that the divine beverage consumed during Yangya, the fire worship ritual, feast, sacrifices, and before charging into the battles, was distilled from a plant with leaves and flowers and juice stalks that were then mixed with spices and fruit extracts and possibly honey. However, not a single hypothesis about the brewing ingredients of this magical potion could sadly be confirmed as neither of the four Vedas. Yudravita, Samvita, Atarvita, Rigveda, and the Avesta gives us no cohesive recipe for it. The Anti-Addiction Holy Hallucinogen In the heart of Gabon, Africa, the indigenous people engage in captivating witty rituals that revolve around consuming the powerful psychedelic iboga root. These extraordinary ceremonies transcend religious barriers, attracting followers of Christianity, Catholicism, and Islam alike as they come together to honor nature, creatures, and their ancestors. That's the root of l'iboga. Et là, elle est dans son état brut. Donc, c'est un échantillon que j'ai déraciné pour toujours montrer aux gens à partir du moment où ils ont besoin de savoir à quoi ça ressemble l'iboga. Larger doses of iboga lead to significant hallucinations, and the dose used for the Bwiti initiation causes temporary unconsciousness. The complex religious system of Bwiti is unique in relation to the surrounding indigenous African religions and cults, and has a long history of traditions. 
The Bwiti customs are entirely about self-discovery, spiritual insight into the nature of reality, uncovering the spiritual veil, and encountering oneself in the innermost sense. The Bwiti do have a set of initiation and progression rituals, during which a change of consciousness and insight into the nature of reality is achieved once again, using the Iboga roots. For centuries, Bwiti initiates eat or drink the Iboga root to open themselves to visions and accept an understanding of reality one does not learn but observes. This is caused by a chemical called ibogaine, present in the root bark of Iboga, that is illegal in the U.S. due to its high potential for exploitation. Ibogaine might cause brain stimulation, irregular heartbeat, difficulty breathing, anxiety, hallucinations, low blood pressure, and if taken too much, seizures, paralysis, and or death. Today, ibogaine therapy in countries like Mexico is becoming a curious solution and treatment for PTSD, depression, and addiction. They are, however, mostly unregulated, with some of them run by people with no medical qualification who have used ibogaine to get clean and want to help others do the same. They are generally more affordable than traditional rehab clinics in the U.S., costing about ten dollars to $15,000, and offer addicts another option when rehabilitation and 12-step programs have failed. There is a question of ethics about a right to profit off indigenous knowledge and ecology. As most of the Ibogaine's medical use is still unregulated, the plant is coming to the crosshairs of the infamous African poachers, which means a threat to the Bwiti culture. Meanwhile, in Mexico, supply is striving to match demand. The Sacred Psychedelics of Americas For centuries, the shamans of the Mazatec Indians of Oaxaca have used salvia divinorum for divinatory and religious purposes. It has been used in medicinal practices to treat diarrhea, headache, rheumatism, anemia, and a semi-magical disease known as panzón de borrego, or swollen belly, which they believe to be caused by an evil sorcerer. Current studies have not shown any adverse side effects that can help decide whether or not this hallucinogen can be legalized. For centuries, healers or curanderos would cure culture-bound syndromes with rituals using salvia. Midwives or parteras would use it to accompany women during pregnancy, birth, and childbed, and experts in illnesses of the skeletal muscular system who were called with settles would cure sprains, fractures, and bruises. Apart from the medicinal purposes, the Mazatec Indians have used it holistically to induce shamanic visions. And yet, it is interesting that Salvia divinorum lacks a true Mazatec name. There is strong evidence that Salvia was originally used in Aztec culture due to a possible depiction of Salvia on ancient Aztec murals. It is theorized that salvia could be the mysterious hallucinogen named Pipilzinzatili, hope I got that right, or you call it the Little Prince. Sacred to Tura is common to the American Southwest, Caribbean, and West Indies, and has woven itself into the history of the landscape and the people who have inhabited the area. Otherwise known as the Tura Raitai, it is a species of plant within the nightshade family, and its striking white flowers bloom at night and close before noon the next day. The impression of sacred datura could be found in many shamanic and religious rituals of indigenous people of the American Southwest and surrounding areas, but it was the signature element of their coming-of-age rituals. In the traditional Shumash rites of passage, the youth would be asked to drink a beverage called momoi. It would arguably enhance the soon-to-be man's spiritual well-being to prepare him for manhood. The plant was also central to the Zuni people's relationship with rain. Powdered datura root would be used by rain priests to ensure fruitful rains, an especially necessary action in the arid southwest. Further south among tribes in northern Mexico and parts of Texas, datura was used by shamans to transcend the borders of life and death and communicate with spirits. The sacred plant is thus a deeply significant part of the southwest's cultural history. The indigenous people of Peru perceive the Amazon rainforest as a living, conscious entity filled with diverse life forms that are interconnected and interdependent by nature. Their deeply rooted beliefs, values, and attitudes are expressed through their practices, rituals, and traditions. Many of them are named after a brew called ayahuasca that is made from the native Banosteriopsis capi vine and the Psychotria veritas shrub leaves. Its name comes from the Quechua language where aya means spirit or ancestor and huasca means vine thus forming the translation often used, vine of the soul or vine of the spirits. The origins of ayahuasca are considered lost secrets, as there is no exact documentation of when it first came into use. Many indigenous tribes believe that nature itself bestowed them with the knowledge of ayahuasca at a time when animals and humans spoke the same language. Ayahuasca has traditionally been used as a tool for divination, healing, and spiritual communion among these tribes. Indigenous shamans known as curanderos or ayahuasqueros perform ayahuasca rituals under the belief that they can connect with the spirit world for guidance. The rituals are aimed at healing physical and mental ailments. 
removing malevolent spirits or solving problems affecting their community. These ceremonies traditionally take place in the evening, are led by a trained shaman, and can last up until dawn. In the last few decades, awareness and interest in ayahuasca ceremonies have grown globally, leading to a surge in ayahuasca tourism. There's growing interest in the potential therapeutic benefits of ayahuasca in treating conditions like depression, anxiety, PTSD, and addiction. This has led to more people seeking out ayahuasca as a form of alternative healing or psychotherapy, often within the retreat model. Similarly, San Pedro cactus and peyote contain the hallucinogen mescaline. It's been used by Native American tribes, such as the Huichul and the Tawahumara in North America and the Andes for religious ceremonies and healing rituals that usually are also on an overnight affair. However, peyote becoming a vulnerable species has made the cactus's use an ecological dilemma. Mad Honey Tucked away in the stunning yet intimidating Himalayan mountains of Nepal lies a quaint village called Galigan, meaning Mad Village. It's uncertain whether the name refers to the local produce or the daring methods employed to harvest it. In Galigan, Nepal, honey harvesters must climb over 800 feet of dangerous cliffs using only flimsy ropes without any safety gear. A pound of this special honey can fetch over $160 in illegal markets. The allure of this honey lies not in its taste or texture, but in its remarkable after effects. In fact, this is possibly the most bitter known honey and has a reddish grating about it that makes it look marred with blood. But this honey is still precious and popular among many. If we go back in time, the Roman noble and general Pompey the Great may disagree. In 67 BC, during the Mithridatic War, Pompey's army was chasing Mithridates IV, king of Pontus, across his kingdom. Tired of running, Mithridates ordered his men in Trabzon to fill the roads of the city with pots of honey to welcome the Romans. But this was no ordinary honey. When bees feed on the pollen of the rhododendron flowers, the resulting honey can pack a severe hallucinogenic punch. It may give one mild psychoactive effect when consumed in small quantities. But the 1,000 Roman soldiers who consumed this honey in quantities of full pots felt immensely sick to the point that they were unable to move or defend themselves, and the Persian army eliminated all of them. Two centuries earlier, the Athenian philosopher and general of the Achaemenid army called 10,000, Xenophon mentioned in his book Anabasis about his failed campaign to march to Babylon. His army discovered the city of Trabzon had an abundance of beehives that were ripe with honey. However, unaware of what sort of honey it was, soon his troops began complaining of vomiting and diarrhea after devouring the honeycombs. They were so out of their own that they couldn't even stand up or sit straight. By evening, heaps of men were lying over each other sick and mad. Yet miraculously, every single one of them recovered completely the next morning after having slept it off. Thousands of years after the mass elimination of Pompey's army, Empress Olga of Kiev used mad honey to eliminate the 5,000-strong Russian army. Though mostly common around the Black Sea, mad honey is also common in the cliffs of Nepal as well as surprisingly in certain parts of the U.S. The nectar collected by the giant Himalayan honeybee from the rhododendron flowers and leaves contains grayano toxins. This toxin wreaks havoc on your body by latching onto sodium ion channels, keeping them open longer than they should be. As a result, sodium and calcium ions rush in like a flood, triggering the release of oxytocaline and causing your blood pressure and heart rate to plummet. While a moderate dose might give you a wild ride, be warned, a high dose could be deadly. Despite its hefty price on the black market, mad honey is still a bargain compared to the safer regulated version found in pharmacies. Industrial players like distilleries harness its power to amplify the potency of alcoholic drinks. Meanwhile, pharmaceutical companies cultivate mad honey in controlled environments to create a range of treatments including antidepressants, stress relievers, painkillers for arthritis and sore throats, cholesterol regulators, and diabetes management. It even finds its way into performance-enhancing medications. The Philosopher's Stones Behold the Psilocybe tamponensis, a psychedelic mushroom that boasts a legendary title echoing the ancient pseudoscience of alchemy, the Philosopher's Stone. Often compared to the biblical tale of King Midas, this mythical stone, said to have been unearthed by the 13th century alchemist Albertus Magnus, was believed to possess the power to transmute base metals into gold and extend life. Today's generation is more familiar with the Philosopher's Stone because of the Harry Potter series' first book. Though it sounds bizarre to give a mythical name to a bunch of trippy fungi, alchemy is a philosophical subject connecting humanity and earthly minerals spiritually. Even the myth states that despite the name, the Philosopher's Stone is not a stone, not a bone, not of metal. So there is a good chance it's a plant? It doesn't say it's not of wood or leaves, right? 
The 19th century set of books collectively called the Secret Doctrine tries to find a link between witchcraft, ancient Eastern wisdom, and modern science. Contemporary consumers of these mushrooms have often compared them to the Red Pill of the Matrix movie as they are perceived as a gateway to a world more vivid, strange, and thought-provoking. Philosopher stone mushrooms are like a variety of substrates, but these mushrooms have a particular affinity for rich grassy soils and often spring up in fields and pastures. They were first found around Tampa City. They're even known to make an appearance in manure fertilized lawns popping up in circular formations. In 2018, researchers at John Hopkins found that psilocybin was an effective treatment for depression, nicotine, and alcohol addictions, as well as other substance use disorders. Studies have also shown that magic mushrooms were effective in relieving the emotional distress of people with life-threatening cancer diagnoses. Morning Glory At the river edges and the disturbed forests of Mexico and the rest of Central America, flowers of a tropical vine bloom only in the early hours of the morning aptly named Morning Glory. These flowers have a unique symbiotic relationship with highly specialized fungi of the Paraglandula genus. The mother plants pass their fungus on through the seeds. These seeds have been used since ancient times in ritual ceremonies. For example, the Maya used the plant in a beverage to facilitate communication with the spirits to predict the future or to come to an understanding of otherwise incomprehensible events. Morning glory seeds in moderate amounts are considered harmless and it takes quite a large quantity to cause hallucinations, but that also means risking the possibility of diarrhea. The effects such as mood elevation, sense of deep insight, hallucinations, and visual distortions are usually felt within 20 to 40 minutes and peak within three to four hours. The effects usually last for about eight hours. Too much morning glory can also cause paranoia, dilated pupils, rapid heart rate, and anxiety, along with diarrhea. The Divine Drink of Pacific. Called every possible name between kava and waka, kava is not some pest-like flora. It is considered a therapeutic and spiritual herb by many from Fiji to Australia and from New Zealand to Hawaii. Most scholars agree that kava was first grown in the islands of Vanuatu, Fiji, and New Guinea starting around 3,000 years ago. It spread throughout the South Pacific when these islanders started exploring the ocean in their sailing canoes. Today, kava is part of the cultural and social fabric across the oceans and is Fiji's national drink. For thousands of years, kava has been a social drink that produces feelings of relaxation and euphoria. More recently, it's been used as an alternative in medicine as a stress reliever, painkiller, and a cure for insomnia, migraine, and chronic fatigue syndrome. Kava bars have been cropping up recently in the U.S. as well. Thanks for watching Nutty History. If you'd like to support our cause and effort, like and share this video. Subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to watch more nutty videos about human history.